Oh, welcome here to theCUBE's coverage, continuing coverage of Ansible Fest 2021. It's a pleasure to have you with us today and also to join us today is Stephen Elliott, who is the Group Vice President of Management Software and DevOps at IDC. And Stephen, good to see you today. Thanks for being here on theCUBE. Hey, thanks, John. It's great to be here. You bet, good. No, thank you again for the time. Um, well, let's just jump right in. I know um, this is right in your sweet spot. You know, talk about IT automation. Uh, you've done a lot of research on this, but let's just talk about overall, if you will, um, give us that 30 foot perspective of what you're seeing in terms of your research when we talk about IT automation these days and configuration sure, yeah. management. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, um, it's been fascinating to watch with COVID, the acceleration of the investments in automation across the board. And really our, our enterprise IT inquiry that we've taken, it really is, is just fascinating to see whether it's network automation, looking at self-service configuration, looking at provisioning, looking at a patch. I mean, you name the manual toil that enterprise IT organizations are you know, looking to automate. And we're just finding tremendous investment themes you know, across those areas. Um, I think on top of that, there's been a lot of acceleration of um, this idea of, of DevOps, of uh, driving automation across development and operations teams. And then certainly realizing that it's really hard to hire great people. Um, and so we're seeing that companies are utilizing automation as a way to drive you know, career development, training across teams. And then certainly as a, as a way to, to augment their teams to help these teams scale when they have difficulties hiring more and more staff. Yeah, well, let's well, let's take that first one uh, or that last point first here. I think that's a, that's a, a certainly a valuable point. In that we've heard a lot about labor all over in all sectors, right? About you know finding uh, the right talent uh, for the task. So in terms of of this process, IT automation, and you're talking about maybe. Uh, some companies being somewhat shorthanded or trying to fine tune, you know, their their labor needs or whatever. Um, tell me a little bit more about that in terms of automation and how this helps that process rather than than hinders it. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, sometimes when IT executives talk about automation, they talk about staff replacement, and that. For for the lean forward companies, for for most companies that make these investments, that's not the case at all. It's actually an augmentation strategy where they realize, look, it's really hard to find great talent. We have an opportunity to take the talent we have, apply new skills, uh, look at automation as a way to get existing teams more productive, as well as an opportunity to learn new skills across teams. Um, you know, whether it's development, operations, site reliability, engineering, IT ops, et cetera, networking. You know, we're seeing uh, organizations have uh, a much more um, impact, you know, much more impactful opportunity to do staff development. Um, and so this helps with scale. It also just helps give organizations, um, you know, the opportunity to move people across teams, particularly if you've decided that there's, there's one type of, of automation that you want to utilize, one type of configuration language. Um, so it, it makes things, um, very interesting when you have, you know, an operations person who might want to become a site reliability engineer or, you know, a DevOps team that understands they have to utilize automation. Maybe they want to utilize, you know, a common framework for that. So, you know, we're seeing um, executives really look at this as this isn't about staff replacement at all. It's actually quite the opposite. It's about retention. It's about career training and development. It's about, you know, being able to share staff across teams. And then certainly, you know, this whole notion of augmentation and increasing productivity. Um, a lot of organizations realize that, you know, with these generally net new models, you know, containers, microservices, public cloud, DevOps, software defined infrastructure, um, you know, agile, all these different organizational constructs and, and uh, types of technology architectures are driving up compl complexity. So the ability to simplify that through automation um, the ability to drive higher returns on investment through automated processes and workflows. Uh, you know, it's really uh, striking a chord with executive teams. And, and, and uh, this is obviously, uh, I think just part of this natural trend, right? As the complexity of the networks and operations has increased, uh, finding efficiencies through automation, that's just kind of this natural flow. Has it been pand or how has it been pandemic driven? to a certain respect and you touched on that earlier with your first comments, but but what have you seen let's say over the past year 
and how companies have been reacting to that environment into their business operations. Yeah, no, it's, it's been it's been interesting from the C-suite down, particularly um, where CEOs have really started to realize that often their business architecture is in fact their technology architecture. And the pandemic has forced the C-suite to change their customer engagement models more often than not. So many, you know, B2B companies now had to become B2C. And so, you know, many companies had to pull back or scale back their operations in the case of, you know, hotel, lodging, airlines, where they, they really had to realize, wow, you know, we've got to figure out something because, you know, we're not going to fill capacity. Um, so you had a lot of CEOs and CIOs recognize that their technology architecture, in fact, can help make these adjustments. And part of that is driving automated, you know, work streams, uh, whether it's through, you know, new digital services, whether it's through, you know, faster provisioning of infrastructure for their DevOps and development application teams, whether it's driving higher levels of system reliability, which as we all know, you know, customers are pretty impatient. So mm -hmm. if digital services aren't working, you're going to move on to something else pretty quickly and give a, you know, competitor, you know, revenue opportunity. So. I think a lot of those swim, you know, a lot of those um, tailwinds, I should say, have really struck a chord in the C-suite, and has really driven investments that are driving, you know, core modernization, application modernization, um, customer engagement models, and business models that that you know weren't around 24 months ago. Um, we're finding that the focus on reliability of systems, you know, across the applications uh, to involve systems and networks that are, are you know, public, private are really, you know, having that transparency. These things are the foundation. You know, you think about building a house, these are foundational capabilities that from an operations perspective, from a development perspective, have really helped shape a lot of the thinking and investment themes at the C-suite now, you know, because COVID accelerated a lot of these modernization projects have really driven, you know, positive outcomes for. And when you talk about impatience, um, uh, there's also, kind of a, um, I guess, a, a queasiness, you might say, or some anxiety about any kind of change, you know, and as you're talking about these automated processes and, and bringing the, the, the whole new realm of opportunity into the business, it also, also introduces maybe some angst, I, I would think a little bit. Well, what are you telling or what do you see in clients and what kind of advice are you giving them in terms of their IT automation decisions and, um, and about deploying, these really massive changes in some respects to how they conduct their business? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And we get that quite often. Um, what we advise are, are a couple starting points. You know, first and foremost, most organizations are automating something somewhere. Um, and particularly with, with DevOps teams, you know, development, SREs, operations, infrastructure platform teams, networking teams, you know, these, these teams have a lot of opportunity to automate their toil. And so you have to start somewhere. So pick a use case that you know you can you can win, you can get great benefits and a, and a high return on that investment. And as you sort of go through that at the team or departmental level, start then to think about what are additional processes you know across your peer group. You know maybe you're in networking, you should be talking to operations, maybe in ops, talking to the DevOps teams, and development, etc. And really start to highlight some additional ways that you can utilize that that singular platform and reach across you know, your peer groups to drive you know, more integrated, more automated processes. And these are types of use cases that run the gamut. So from a development standpoint, these would be you know, application release, it would look at CI, CD, uh, you know, pipeline deployments, et cetera. Um, of course, you know, manual, moving from manual automated testing is a hot button issue. But from an operational perspective, many of those processes interlock right, with provisioning, with security mechanisms and, and processes. And then of course, you know, the involvement of the network in terms of, you know, configuration, which is a cost mm -hmm. issue. So things like configuration, provisioning, self-service, you know, the interlock of, of security mechanisms, a lot of these are, are pretty common themes, regardless of the team, you know, and regardless of, of the outcome that's that's you know required. So I think first and foremost, start start small but think big. Secondly, think about a potential platform play as it relates to automation. The third piece is make sure you get the right peer groups involved in the key stakeholders. Um, you know, this isn't something that you just flip the switch and boom, you know, you're successful. This will take a little bit of time. 
and it's impactful in terms of the team, impactful in terms of the processes, and of course, you know, the technology. So having a, a strong leader and a you know set of key stakeholders who can drive this to fruition um, can really, you know, not only get great wins from the business perspective, but also really drive, you know, a continuous improvement model and drive that theme of, of automation, you know, particularly as it relates to agile and DevOps and site reliability engineering, it can really play an important role in helping scale out those successes that many of those teams have already sort of built. So it's an extension of, of the investment, but at the same time, it just makes for, you know, a continual cycle of improvement opportunities for these teams to drive you know, further automation you know, across their particular processes. Well, this is obviously uh, based on uh, a lot of the Ansible Fest coverage. I, I talked about that off the, on the outside of the interview. So let's just focus on Red Hat for a little bit here. Uh, first off, give me your take, uh, give me your, your uh, uh, two cents on Red Hat in terms of you know, how they're doing. And then obviously some big announcements, you know, Portworks and then some on the uh, Ansible platform. So uh, first off, give me a little idea on Red Hat and then let's drill down to the news they're making with their announcements. Sure. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, Red Hat Ansible um, is continues to do very well in the marketplace, uh, both from an adoption perspective, as well as just you know continuing to get you know, more net new logos. Um, you know, in addition to that, you know, post the Red Hat IBM acquisition, IBM continues to take advantage of, of Ansible across its portfolio. So, you know, we're seeing further uh, reach into the market and into accounts that are both IBM and Red Hat related. I think another piece too, we've recently uh, did some work around you know, business value of Red Hat Ansible automation platform. And a lot of those customers really talk to us about this, this notion of you know, starting small, but also thinking more broadly across what type of returns they could get from the platform, as well as you know, it's not just about cost reduction, right? It's really about cost containment. It's about acceleration of you know, pipelines. It's about driving higher uh, levels of system reliability. So the other thing we found our customers are really recognizing it's a balance of business and technical metrics that they want to sort of choose to drive and measure their success. But also at the same point, it's a recognition on the part of, of Red Hat and their product and development teams that they've really listened to a lot of customers, gotten you know, features in and really started to think about this breadth of how automation can support not just operations, but development. You know, this, this idea of autonomous automation, you know, being able to empower different sets of, of personas or customers to drive, you know, faith and trust in a product to say, hey, we want to automate a particular um, piece of a process. And we're just going to, you know, build up the policy, inherently use the templates and boom, turn it on and, and you know, set it and forget it. So that that's you know a coming wave where customers are starting to you know work with Red Hat and particularly the the Ansible platform to understand well, what does that mean you know how do we execute that and then you know as we get more comfortable with turning on that that more autonomous perspective you know how can we then spread that idea out to different teams so you know we're seeing a lot of these themes and and as we talk to customers. Um, you know, hearing a lot of good feedback with regards to you know, Red Hat and IBM taking advantage of the technology, as well as, you know, more importantly, customers getting, you know, significant value and returns from the platform itself. Right. Well, Stephen, um, we appreciate the insights. Uh, certainly uh, it's uh, an interesting future awaiting, of course, the world of IT automation, a lot more intelligence, right? A lot more autonomy. Uh, a lot more challenges, uh, but I'm sure Red Hat is very much up to that. And thank you for being with us here today on theCUBE. Hey, thank you, John. It was great to be here. You bet. Stephen Elliott joining us from IDC talking about Red Hat and Ansible, and we'll continue with more coverage a little bit later on theCUBE. Thanks for joining the, this segment with Stephen Elliott.